Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Ben Britton. Uh, this is Introduction to Electron Backscatter Diffraction, Section 6, where I'm going to talk about uh, data analysis and how we interrogate EBSD maps and how we understand the data that has been collected. So, first and foremost, the software will typically produce a microstructure map, and one thing it will do is it will measure things like the pattern quality. So that just describes broadly how sharp the diffraction pattern is. And we can do that plotting with respect to the positions. Um, things that you can start to think about this is, you know, this is the bottom of the sample. The coordinate systems are well presented and other bits and pieces. But we have to think about how, what do we want to show in our data? What do we want to reduce that diffraction pattern to tell us about the problem at hand? So the pattern quality already gives rise in this particular example in an Inconel sample. You can see bands of large grains with specific crystallographic features. You can see fine scale bands that are present in this sample. This is scanned across a relatively large area. If we look at, for instance, the crystallographic orientations, we'll see these and we'll see and how these work. But these are represented uh, based upon inverse pole figure coloring. Uh, and there are three coloring maps, the inverse pole figure X, Y and Z that will typically be produced. But again, it's what do you want to show in each of these analyses? Specifically, and we'll see in a moment, if you want to show the crystallographic orientations and know the orientation of what this grain is, you actually need two IPF maps to represent the orientation. And we'll see why that matters and why that's important in a bit later. Very specifically, the inverse pole figure says that with respect to the x-axis, the crystal will be presented. If it's red, it will be an 001 direction pointing with respect to the x-axis. So um, this sort of cartoon gives you some ideas. Uh, this is the cartoon with respect to the color map. So effectively, the color map in this example, the 001 direction is pointing with respect to, uh, and in this case, I'm going to show the IPF sort of Z type coloring. So the 100 direction pointing out to plane. In this, effectively, you're looking along the vertex, so you're looking along the 111, so that's the orientation with respect to the imaging axis, and this effectively is looking along the 110 direction, you're pointing along that uh, 110 uh, direction in this case, if it's green. So the reason why you need two inverse pole figures is effectively you do not know if you have the 100 pointing along here, you could effectively have spinning of this crystal. You could rotate the unit cell about the z-axis and it would give you the same red color. It's only when you look along another axis do you see that difference. To be more specific, if we just take some examples, so this is our color coding. Uh, so I've plotted these little cells with respect to the z-axis in this example. So we see that effectively this has an 001 pointing out of the page. This has a 111 pointing out of the page. This here has a 110 pointing out of the page. So if I have this little cube and I look at the IPF Z coloring for this little cube, I can see that this is the 001 pointing out of the page. And so it is red within this map. Now, this is a little bit of a thought experiment, so you may want to pause and have a think yourself. But if you're looking along the Y axis, what is the crystal direction that points along the y-axis? And for this cube orientation, the crystal direction pointing along the y-axis, again, is an 001 type, and so it comes across as red in the IPF coloring. It necessarily follows that the third coloring for the cubic structure in this orientation is that it is a 100 type pointing along x in this example. If we take a new cube, and we've now rotated about the y-axis, we can see that pointing along the z direction of our unit cell, uh, sorry, a z direction of our sampling system, we now have a 110 direction pointing along the z. So it is green in that color. We have rotated the cell about the y axis, and so it is still pointing a 100 along the y axis. And if we look along the x axis, it's rotated 45 degrees, i.e., it has a 110 pointing along the x direction. And so this is why you get green, red, green. This highlights again why you need two color maps to show the orientation because you can see the multiplicity problem that's happening, that it's both red if the crystal is rotated about that crystallographic axis. 
If you look at this uh, unit cube, I've now rotated it. So along the Z axis, effectively it has the 111 pole pointing along that, so it's bright blue. If you look along the X axis, it's effectively got a 110 type pointing along there, and so that's green. And uh, along the uh, Y axis, it's something in between those two, it's somewhere around here, I think. And so it's this sort of tealy uh, type color for that one. Uh, the last color that I show is effectively, so if we look at this example, along Z, it's the 001. Along Y, it's effectively a 110 type. And along X, it's a 110 type. Now note, there are many variable colors, but, but a first order approximation, if you can understand this sort of table, you're doing pretty well at interpreting the data. Uh, better ways to view this is to actually look at the color crystal orientations, and if you have a relatively sparse map, as shown here, you can see the crystal orientations. Hopefully you can now see that this is a blue map in effectively the z-axis, which shows that the 111 direction is pointing out at page. If we look at specific examples, so we have this sort of purpley gray, so this red grain, this now has the 100 pointing out a page, and you can see it's green in the other two maps because exactly as suggested beforehand, it has that rotation where 110 points along X and points along Y. Now, checklist for the orientation mapping, and this is important if you're reviewing EBSD papers or if you're presenting them yourself. You should ask, is there a physical scale bar you're describing a microstructure? Is there a color key for what the data you're presenting? Is there an axis system that's presented in this? So have you shown the X, Y, and Z in here? So Z is pointing out of page. It's a right-handed set. So I would typically write that in the figure caption. Can I tell the orientation? So are there two maps or are there the unit cube shown? Do I know the grain boundary angle? So where I'm segmenting this data to show grain boundaries. So these are sharp contrast changes of greater than five degrees in this data set. But this is all within the, the context of what story do I want to tell within my materials. So there's a story you want to tell and there's the interrogation of what others want to know. So in this case, you may want to produce the data and a script, so things like mtech are very useful, so other people can plot and interrogate the data yourself. And for instance, uh, within uh, the research group I lead, we started to release our EBSD data with the papers. So people can use that data in ways that we may not have imagined, for instance. Now, importantly, many of you may be working on different symmetry crystals. There is one subtlety that's a bit frustrating. In the uh, HCP process, HCP material systems, for crystal directions, there is a difference in what we call three index and four index notation. So just be slightly careful of this. So if you have three index notation, and specifically we have our crystallographic unit cell, effectively with A1, A2, and A3, this is with respect to the A direction, this is with respect to B, and this is with respect to C, the outer plane direction. B is parallel to A2. So a 1, 2, O direction effectively goes along A once, it goes along B twice. So the sum of this vector is effectively running across in this direction. Okay. In uh, four index notation, this is actually the uh, one one. Uh, sorry, one bar one O type. Uh, one one. Uh, sorry, bar one one O type crystal direction. So you can see there is a significant difference between three and four index notation. Care with the brackets. Just bear this in mind. If you look at a different orientation, so you look effectively at running negative A3 in this case, that would look like effectively A plus B in this case. That is different because that's effectively the 1, 1, bar 2, O direction. So just, just be slightly careful of how this thing's set up, of what these numbers look like. I, I note this at this point. This is important because effectively what it means is when you look and you've got square brackets on the color key, so it's with respect to directions in three index notation for an HCP material. The blue is this presentation of crystal with respect to the z-axis, I think in this example. This is effectively the uh, green crystal in here. So just to be slightly careful. Uh, sorry, it's with, yeah, 
So just be slightly careful of this. Uh, two IPFs are needed for this, so be slightly careful. We can check this, so here's a color coding of this. So IPF X, this will effectively be an A type direction, so it's a green color in this. IPF Y, this is effectively an A plus B direction, so it's running in this direction, so it's blue, it's the one, one, uh, one bar one oh oh in this. The little bars have disappeared slightly. Um, and the Z axis, it's the C, it's red. If you rotate this by uh, 90 degrees, it switches these two colors. If you rotate this, so you tilt this crystal, you change that now this IPFX is running along the C axis and you've got the other two colors. And uh, this example is then rotating this 90 degrees, you see that you switch the C axis and move that over. This you can check if you look at some data. So this is then showing effectively I've plotted uh, the different crystal planes in this example, but I can show consistency that I'm behaving myself with regards to the orientation that's extracted from these points. I flagged this just to be slightly careful uh, and to be very careful when you're reading this for the first time. The other thing you may want to do is to look at the not, not just the specific orientations of various points, you may want to consider the average orientations across your polycrystalline aggregate. This average orientations, this is called the crystallographic texture. Electron backscatter diffraction enables you to examine the micro texture and to segment the texture for say different phases or different grain sizes. By texture, what I mean effectively is what is the average crystal orientation? And we can consider this in a two dimensional problem. So if I just ask myself, what is the average vector that's presented if I effectively have random distribution of the vectors pointing in a circle. So this would give me a uniform description of the vectors that effectively I have one times uniform for the different inclinations, the angle theta as moving around this circle. Now, if I remove one of those orientations, I remove one of those vectors, I will then get a decrease that I will have if I was sampling this data set I would effectively be less likely to find this orientation of vector, so I'd have a decrease of time ra times random over here. The width is related to a formal thing called the convolution. The detail is not too important for now, but it does matter. Um, but that's how you do the sampling from a discrete to a continuous function. If I replaced that vector and basically changed its orientation to run now downwards, Effectively, you would get an increase if you just sampled randomly in this distribution. You would have an increase in finding the orientation pointing downwards. You will have a decrease in the one pointing horizontal. And so you get this change in times random distributions. The thought experiment continues. You extend this to three dimensions, where instead of just pointing at these, you now have them pointing effectively on the surface of a sphere for particular crystal planes or crystal directions that are sampled. This is a classic texture for zirconium in our system. So we have the, uh, the uh, crystallographic orientations, sorry, the sample orientations. This is of a rolled plate. So we have the rolling direction, the transverse and the normal direction. We have the pole figures with respect to the basal planes, uh, with respect to the first and second order prism planes in here. This particular crystal orientation is called the split basal, so it has the C-axis that's pointing approximately 30 degrees off the normal direction. Uh, we have the times random, so we see there is a greater chance of finding orientations with respect to that. Or specifically, if we looked along TD, there would be a greater chance of seeing, say, blue and green orientations with respect to our crystal direction maps, which is what we see if we look with regards to the IPF TD in this case. We tend to plot textures in pole figure maps with respect to planes. That's because effectively texture can also be measured with x-ray diffraction off crystal planes. In a formalization, I'm not going to worry about it too much, but we formalize, we convolute our discrete measurements into an orientation distribution function. And you've got to be slightly careful in what the convolution half width and the number of grains in your sampling. In order to reliably describe texture, you'll often want to have, say, 10,000 grains. But for statistics, you effectively just need a equi representation of the points to area. So you can just have effectively one point per grain, but they need to be points that are equally spaced across the map. There are some artifacts that happen in EBSD. And so one, for instance, is that if you have a very sharp texture, you can get 
uh, what are called sort of harmonic fitting issues. These are like related to sort of uh, ringing artifacts in a Fourier transform. They're related functions. So you can see if you have bright spots, you get the symmetric sort of bleeding artifacts off them in this case. The other issue is that there is a sampling problem that if you do not have a representative number of grains, the question follows with regards to the texture strength and also the convolutional function, how you go from the discrete orientations into the continuous function. There are some just very specific details that are important for texture analysis. The average crystal orientations in 3D is what the texture describes. For different crystal plane representations, you will get the symmetry can be important in terms of how the times random calculations work. The peak values, what you read across here in the times random map, and the presence of spotty textures can be related to the number of grains sampled and the convolution functions that are needed, i.e. how the sum and fitting to the texture is actually done in practice. There can also be aliasing issues with regards to spherical harmonics, so how you fit it, and that's what gives rise to these little bumps that are phantom, they're not actually there. If you want to compare textures between samples, this can be very important, and so that's why I flagged this. Do have a look at some literature on texture measurements for good practice. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions uh, on this. With EBSD, you may also want to measure grain size. One of the key things is to determine what you consider a grain size to be. So what is a grain? It may be effectively an interface that has a specific misorientation, such as, say, five degrees or more. It can be statistically or sort of a number decided, or it can be related to some physical description of a grain boundary. Do note that you have a grain boundary distribution in your material. So in this tungsten carbide system, it's a powder metallurgy system. Uh, sorry, powder. It's a hard metal powder in a binder. So the particles have a specific distribution subject to what was put in the system. That's why effectively you can think about that and fit this to a cumulative or QQ plot of the cumulative frequency distribution for the size of the distribution against the cumulative probability. If it fits in a QQ plot, it's a straight line. This can be found in MATLAB. There's a tool called PROBPLOT to do that. Specifically, what is this, this pushes you towards what is the description of the distribution. Often they will be log normal or thereabouts, but it may depend on the processing conditions. Other issues, are there systematic biases in your grain size distribution? So for instance, do you systematically miss very small grains? Or do you systematically miss very large grains because you don't sample enough area? And have you effectively trimmed the data set to remove the edge grain population, where clearly the grain size is not representative of your sample? There is another question, what is a representative area or number of grains? A way to test this problem is to oversample or produce a larger area map. And then you could, for instance, if you measured, if you measured the grain size, in the quarter of the map and you measured these four quarters does the grain size reflect the overall map if so your sampling you could use a smaller sample to describe your grain size distribution in there the other matter is what is the grain size going to be used for what are you actually describing in terms of a mechanism or physical property for grain size it may just be that it's quality assurance that you have the same distribution between two processing routes the other aspect is that these are three-dimensional objects that are being sectioned, and so there's a whole area of uh, maths called sterology. It's a very classical field, but that's important perhaps for you to look at if you care about grain size distributions of three-dimensional objects with two-dimensional sections. The other mapping stuff is you can get quality metrics, so you can look effectively at pattern quality. So pattern quality in a formalized is written as the sum of the Hof peaks divided by the average Hof intensity. It's a semi-quantitative metric. Low is low quality. It's often poorly normalized in the softwares, and it's related to the sample preparation, the orientation of the individual crystal, and it's also phase dependent. So it's not something you can arbitrarily measure across different experiments. But generally speaking, if you're having the same settings and same samples, you can have a look at that distribution and say, oh, I didn't polish this well enough today, or oh, I did do it great, what was the recipe I used? In some uh, software, there is something called the confidence index that's related to TSL, EDAX, or Amatec. Uh, that effectively is uh, related to uh, how well the uh, indexing was done. 
and a high CI or close to one is good. Um, the statistics are if you've got a CI greater than 0.05 in a single phase sample of aluminium, 95% of your index would be correct in this case. Uh, the other index that's often is the MAD or FIT. That describes how well the bands match between the lookup table and the experiment. That a high number is a poor FIT, and so that is a way to reject poor quality data. Often, for instance, if you're matching two phases and doing a phase classification, the best MAD will win. That clearly the MAD is calibration dependent because if you get the source point position wrong, then the mean angular deviation will systematically vary. And so that's why calibration on a known phase with good diffraction patterns can be important in, in your experiment. Um, I'm not going to talk too much, but in software packages, you can do data cleanup. So data cleanup, your data may be incomplete, i.e. points are not solved. And specifically, for instance, if you want to export this data to something else, you may need it to be a continuous, uh, wholly completed map. EBSD, if you choose, uh, the data can be spatially correlated. By that I mean, effectively, if you have a misindex point next to or inside a grain, you know it's probably of the same orientation as the neighbourhood. So you can effectively fill in the gaps due to a whole range of methods and approaches. There is a whole description of different cleanup methods within MTech in the MTech tutorials. One thing I drive uh, and be very specifically careful about is that there are systematic issues where effectively you can introduce BIOS, such as you could have systematic misindexing of minor phases, and you could have BIOS affecting, say, uh, if you do a grain dilation, you can get BIOS affecting grain size because the rate of change of perimeter to grain size may change on a grain dilation metric. Um, and so that can give you specific systematic issues in reconstructing data. So be careful and check your cleanup is reproducing truth rather than fabricating something that is just an artifact of the cleanup. Importantly, please report what you have done in your cleanup, uh, in your paper or in the appendix, or even better, produce the code that was used to do it. At this point, uh, we can pause. Uh, our next section will be on conducting an EBSD experiment.